Right. So tonight I'm talking about ley lines, the energy centers and vortexes and the nodes around the earth and what they are. And I actually have been reading for many months about this and I seem to have opened a big rabbit hole that I'm still falling through because it's a fascinating subject. The ley lines that people talk about and they're getting interested are kind of like veins. We have veins in our body where our blood goes all around the in and out of each organs in the heart. And the energy in the earth is very, very similar. It circles the earth, it stops, it crosses. And there are power centers and places that you can go to actually feel this. And I will get to that in just a moment. But it actually has been known for eons. And people, even unknowingly, would stop and they would either cancel sites or create a temporary home or just relax. And then later, people used to erect structures on the sites. A lot of the older structures were pagan in origin or earthbound in origin. And some of them actually are still there and they're always finding new ones. Now, just a quick history from way far back. A lot of the places that we hold sacred today have many churches and parishes from the Christian religion. And being familiar with the history, everyone knows that in the Dark Ages, Christianity came in and tried to take over everything. And a lot of times what they did when they found a line or crossing of lines, they put a church or something significant on there. Um, being what she is, Mother Earth always wants to improve. So even with churches, she's going to grow something, a tree or vines, or somehow mark that path. And a lot of the old structures that are now in ruins, they're actually pretty nice to look at, even though the structure is not complete anymore. You'll see a lot, a lot of greenery and a lot of trees actually do spring up along these roads. So she's alive and she's well, and she's constantly renewing herself. The first modern notice that ley lines got were by a gentleman named Alfred Hawkins in 1921. He became interested because he noticed in the countryside where he lived in England that unusual things were lining up where they shouldn't have. And so he did some research. He actually found out that structures on ley lines were put there since before the Roman and the Greek empires, eons ago, ages ago. And people kept erecting structures because they somehow felt connected on these lines. They felt the power rushing through the earth and they detected where it was comfortable or not comfortable and they would move. He wrote two books, one called The Old Straight Track, where he actually talks a lot about the geographical structures and where they are and enumerates them. And then he wrote Ley Lines also, which is basically the same things. He goes into a little bit of more personal detail when it comes he finds these and he actually organized a group of gentlemen back at the time and they were called lay hunters. What these individuals did was actually go out into the countryside with dowsing balls and other means to try to locate lines and then map them out as the picture on the right says they did find quite a few. So if anybody's interested, these books are really not that expensive. All of my references, I mostly got off Amazon. And uh, of course, there's others. And even today, 
Lay hunters are still finding small offshoots from major ley lines that run across countrysides, not just in England or Europe or on the other side of the world. They're here in America too, and we have a couple of very distinctive points. Now, some of what they found were hinges, and we're most familiar with Stonehenge being a stone circle. There were also mounds and timber hinges. The timbers were actually cut trees, kind of like our telephone posts, and they put them in a type of formation, mostly circles. And it is thought that this was some kind of clock or seasonal uh, directional plot whereby they figured out when to plant, when to harvest, and when to do other things. The mention of hinges actually started about uh, 3,000 years ago. And they were found, I have some information that they found here. They were actually found by native peoples, mostly migratory peoples. And hinges were continually built for centuries after that, even into the AD, I believe it was that I read. These are of some other books that I've read. I have to admit, the American Ley Lines was a bit out of my budget at the time. So that one I have not read. I do have the other ones, and I'm actually very interested in what the different authors have to say, which is connected to not just the history or the geological places. They also get into whether it's a dimensional portal or whether ghosts travel along the lines. And we'll talk about a little bit more about that later or if the lines are actually in a pattern. And as with patterns, a lot of people have attributed sacred geometry symbols and they have overlaid the earth's grids. Now the one on the bottom right, I thought was interesting because at certain points of crosses, and I'll get into this in a little bit, the earth actually has chakra energy centers just like we do in our bodies. And if you lay some of the geometric symbols down, like the flower of life or the seed of life or the Vesca Pisa, then with the repeating symbols, you can see a pattern. You can also use these ley lines if you happen to live on one or near one. And depending on what you feel and what's around, you could actually work with the energy and bring in manifestations or you can do banishings or other spell work. Besides the sacred geometry, I found out that it was very interesting and has a connection to the Fibonacci square and the golden ratio, which as you all know, happens in many, many places in nature. And a lot of very ingenious engineers have attributed it and built structures such as the Taj Mahal. The golden ratio, I think, is interesting because it's a repetitive and supposedly there is no circles or right angles in nature. However, we see it all the time in different plants in the particular structures that happen with geologic uprisings and tectonic plate movements, and even with the stars in the sky. One of the things that I thought was interesting, and I think this is actually kind of a far reach, crop circles, which have been debunked in many places because a lot of people hold pranks. How about basic 
in sacred geometry, not just because of their structure, but because of how the dimensions are put together and the geometric patterns are represented. I happen to think they're kind of cool looking, especially that one on the upper left of the screen, that nice spiral pattern, which is repeating in many ways. And then just the simple one on the lower right, I like also. Uh, some people still, even to this day, think that aliens have come down and made these circles in the middle of fields. And I'm not gonna go tell them no, because I don't wanna go out in the middle of nowhere and get a fight with anybody. But take what you will. It's interesting reading what theories people come up with. And I also think that it's very creative to come up with this. If you think about it and the time spent to actually create this particular object on paper and then take it out to the field and then enlarge it to this extent, this takes a lot of time. It takes a lot of coordination because usually there's more than one person involved. Now the Nazca lines are really cool. I think they're very interesting. It's been speculated that they've been here 3,000 to 3,500 years and they keep finding more. There's hundreds that they have located. These are the more popular ones and the images that I've pulled. Um, the first published mention of the Nazca lines was by a gentleman named Pedro Cesar de Leon in his book, which was published in 1553, back in Tudor era, in England, I believe, or in Europe somewhere. And he describes them as trail markers. Now, on the heels of that in 1569, Louis Monson reported having seen ancient ruins in Peru. He was an explorer. And he included the ruins of these roads in his writings. And although the lines are particularly visible from the nearby hills, the first to report them in the 20th century were Peruvian uh, military and civilian pilots because they flew overhead and they could see them. In 1927, Peruvian archaeologist Toribio Mijela, and I'm sorry, I cannot pronounce the last name. It's spelled X-E-S-S-P-E. This person spotted them while he was hiking through the foothills, and then he discussed them at a conference in Lima in 1939. So they have been there a while. People have noticed them, and as always, they get noticed because they're interesting. Some of them have geometric patterns, and some of them don't. Personally, I think it's really kind of cool, as big as they are. And as straight as some of these lines are, and as parallel as some of these lines are, I think it's fascinating that whoever created these was able to do that on such a large scale. Now, an American historian named Paul Kosak from Long Island University in New York is credited as the first scholar to study the Nazca lines in depth. While he was in Peru in 1940 to 41, he studied ancient irrigation systems. And then he flew over the lines and realized that one was in the shape of a bird. And I believe that's when they started hypothesizing that they could be more than just trail markers. Now, something else I thought was very interesting, it's not just in South America or Europe or in Asia that we have these things. It's North America also. And I realized when I checked earlier and went through my PowerPoint that the picture on the upper right, the railroads followed the, most of the geomagnetic lines in the United States. Now the one below it is interesting because not only do we have ley lines, we have dragon lines. We have a female rainbow serpent and a male plumed serpent. And where these lines cross, 
are key PowerPoints, not just all over the world, but they are also energy centers and chakra centers. And in the next slide, I overlaid as best I could. And oh, on the bottom lower left, we actually have the ley lines in North America. So we do have things here. Uh, this is not a great representation. It was the best that I could do as an overlay. I really couldn't find anything better. So take it with a grain of salt. I just happened to think it was interesting that a lot of the ge geomagnetic lines follow ley lines. And feel free to look that up if you'd like. Geomagnetic lines in North America and ley lines. I actually looked up ley lines when I first noticed the geomagnetic lines. And I thought it was an interesting connection to the energies flowing through the earth. Now, it's not just the earth that has sacred places. It's all over the world. And some of these are really, really well known, and some of them aren't. Obviously, the Egyptian pyramids, people go visit them all the time. Machu Picchu and Peru, it's known as an Incan citadel, and it also is a sacred place. Stonehenge in the UK, in Wiltshire. Then, Air, what's formerly known as Air's Rock, it's the one toward the top the wonderful, beautiful red rock in Australia, which is actually called Uluru. Now, Sedona, Arizona, which are the pictures on the lower right, that, those, let's see, the two on the far lower right are the Cathedral Rock and the ones toward the inland are Bell Rock. There's also two other places in Sedona called Airport Mesa, and Boynton Canyon. Those are not quite as strong as these two, but somehow I have a personal, really, really interest in these two when I listen to people talk about them. And I watched a couple of videos and then I read about them in some books. Mount Shasta in California also is a wonderful place. That's also the root chakra of the earth, which I'll be talking about in a few minutes. Easter Island, Glastonbury, England, which was the first Christian church site in Britain. The Himalayas, which is located across five countries. And in Tibet, Mount Kailash is also the crown chakra of the world. Of course, the Mayan ruins in Tulu, Mexico, on the Yucatan Peninsula, which this particular structure is located 39 feet up on cliffs, which overlook the Caribbean Sea. Easter Island, by the way, if you're not familiar with it, is located in Chile. Nazca Lines in Peru, of course. And we also have even more, which are fascinating to read about. Ibiza, Spain, Mount Fuji in Japan, Kiev, Ukraine, Angkor Wat in Cambodia, which has some really interesting structures. Cape Town, South Africa, and Bali, Indonesia. Also, and I wanted just to pause for a moment. Maui, Hawaii is very important. It's one of the places where the Earth's heart chakra is. And ever since I heard about the fires recently, I've been trying to figure out if there was a connection because as you all know, energy moves from one place to another. And over the past eight to 10 years, a lot of things have been going on socially and politically and geographically. And I was thinking that Fire cleanses, right? So when a volcano erupts or something happens, then the earth is renewed. And somehow I, being the heart chakra or part of the heart chakra, 
of the earth. I get the feeling and I may be way off, I don't know, but I just kind of get the feeling that Mother Earth is trying to cleanse herself and renew her heart. But uh, take it with a grain of salt. That's just kind of the impression that I got. And uh, we shall move on to the other places. The strongest geomagnetic places, the six most strong on the Earth, are Siberia number one, then Kasar Devi Temple in India, Magnetic Hill in Ladakh, India, Machu Picchu, of course, Stonehenge, and the two poles, the North and the South Poles. And some of these places are also points of interest if you want to go places and visit. Um, big touristy things like the temples not sure if i want to go to the poles or the poles the two places that are really neat here in the united states and you hear more about sedona of course are mount shasta in northern california which is absolutely gorgeous i found many many pictures i just happened to pick this one and then Sedona, Arizona, which we all know is a wonderful place to visit and restore and rejuvenate. Got a couple of notes here. And um, bear with me just a second. I seem to have mislaid what I was going to talk about as far as Sedona. However, I do remember watching in a couple of videos and reading about the trees that are growing on the lines and in a couple of places where lines cross because almost without, um, without exception, the trees are going to twist. And I put two pictures of different trees here in the middle. And I believe these two were not too far from Cathedral Rock and Bell Rock. And the person the, whose video that I watched was talking about the twisted trees and they had a dowsing rod of some sort and they were following the ley line and the crossing of the lines and looking at these trees and taking pictures and speculating, of course, that the energy was flowing so fast up the tree that when it grew, it couldn't handle that amount of energy, and that's why it twisted. I have no clue. I just thought it was interesting, which is why I included it. Now, the chakras of the earth are located all over the earth. Starting with the root which is Mount Shasta in California. And of course, everyone is familiar with the energy centers of the body. So the energy centers of the earth are very much the same. The root chakra represents the impressions and the survival instinct and the foundation. Usually the color is red with the body, but there are other stones that go with that also. The root is also representing the grounding, the boundaries of humanity. And I think this could be the same for the earth chakras. It's also very healing. And the Native Americans called this a spiritual place and the holy mountain. The location of the root chakra is usually at the base of the spine, which is interesting because when I looked at the dragon, go back just a little bit, to find that one picture for you all. Right on the lower right, you can see curvy lines 
one going up and down and the other going down and up, those are the dragon boats where the energy flows around the earth. And I think that everything is connected really tight when the dragon lines are in power and when they take energy from this to the back. And I've heard from those who visited Mount Shasta that it's very calming and very grounding. And you can actually center and have a very nice rejuvenating experience, even just reflecting and being on the mountain. Now, the second chakra is the sacral chakra. It's in South America and it's Lake Titicaca. It's in Peru and Bolivia because it's so large. And it is the largest lake in South America. The qualities of this particular lake and this chakra are both masculine and feminine. It's the core for creativity and self-expression. So if you ever want to take a trip to enhance your creativity and really get into your self-expression, this would be an excellent place. It governs and rules our emotions and the ability to enjoy life. Now, from there, we go to the solar plexus, which is Ayers Rock, Uluru, in Australia. Also, some attribute Kota Tusha, which is Mount Olga, which is another rock formation in Australia. So, both of these points can be considered the solar plexus chakra. And by the way, the chakras do change periodically every 2,160 years approximately. And from what I've read, the heart chakra is actually moving towards South America. So uh, in a few hundred years, it'll be there. And when the chakras change, they change to another location that had a chakra, not someplace new. Not sure why, could not figure that one out. And they're very energetic, just like the points in our body. The spiritual centers and vortexes that swirl around with the energies are very conducive to meditations also and self-exploration and spiritual growth. So the solar plexus chakra down in Australia, which is really cool, is a world heritage site and also known as a site of sacred power. It's believed by the indigenous peoples to be incredibly sacred. And it is said to have great energy that can be re-energizing and help those to reach and realize their higher self, even unconsciously. It's associated with the integrity of our self, the higher purpose here on this plane of existence, and can lay the foundation for confidence in our life path and actually understanding more about our life path. The heart chakra is at Glastonbury Tour and Stonehenge and Shaftesbury. I thought it was interesting. Some places have Stonehenge listed in Wiltshire, England, and some have it listed between Glastonbury and Shaftesbury. So I really didn't get a chance to go and look at a map to explore that area just on the internet, but it's probably around the same area where all of this energy is forming. It's believed to be the current and corresponding locations on Earth, and the history is almost mythical and mystical because of all the legends of King Arthur and the high kings of Ireland and what history has gone on right around that country and actually the beginning of Stonehenge thousands of years ago. It's associated with healing and compassion and also corresponds with forgiveness and giving, which is another reason some people actually say the heart chakra includes Maui, Hawaii. 
So with all that's going on and all the cleansing that Mother Earth is doing to her heart, and with that, I believe she is going to be forgiving and she's going to be healing a lot after the fires are out. And while Glaskenberry and Jasperry are the most agreed upon locations, then also we can look to Hawaii's Kilakala volcano and the energy at the top, which actually gives off the same frequency and vibration of a beating human heart. And I read that on several different websites and in one of the books. The throat chakra, and I just changed it so you can actually see the places. The solar plexus here, we saw Guluru, which was Ayers Rock in another frame. This one happens to be Mount Olga. That's the other one. A beautiful red rock. The throat chakra is interesting because it has actually has three points. It's Mount Olive of Jerusalem, Mount Sinai, and the Great Pyramids of Giza. All three are coordinated with the throat. This is the voice. It represents communication, and it reveals the truth, quote unquote, to others and to our inner selves. So if you visit there and your intuition kicks in, you're not going to be able to hide from your true self and the things that you're receiving. The third eye chakra, which is down toward the bottom right, has no fixed location. That's a floating chakra. Currently, it changes and the agreed upon and I've read, I read several, I just went by the most common agreed upon places where it is currently, is at Stonehenge in England. The site, this is another site that changes every 2,160 years. And the alignment coordinates to the new age, usually at another chakra's location. So it's like this year, we actually moved in, actually the end of last year and beginning of this year, we actually moved into what's called the age of Aquarius. So the shifting energies kind of have to rebalance just like you do if you take a yoga class or if you meditate or if you actually do exercise and come back and eat a nice meal, you rebalance yourself. Or if you're outside in the cold, you come in and get warm, your system rebalances. Or if you're in the hot, you come in, drink water or Gatorade or Powerade or something, your system rebalances. The earth is the very same way. No matter what happens, just like your body, the earth wants to be in a homeostasis, which is status quo. So the floating third eye changes from time to time, and it's always according to the new age. Now, the current movements and predictions, and I think I mentioned this earlier, the current indications predict the movement toward the southwest, toward the sacral chakra in South America, which is Lake Titicaca. The role of this particular center, the third eye, since it's associated with the brain and thinking and cognitive realization, is the center of wisdom, higher consciousness, and intuition. The crown chakra is the highest physical chakra that we have in our bodies, and it's the seventh one on the list, which is Mount Kailish in the Himalayas. And it's absolutely beautiful. It's absolutely the upper right-hand corner, and in one of the previous slides, I got a beautiful picture. Let me see if I can turn it back and find that. Just a second. I need to find that other picture for you. There it is. Right in the center is Mount Kailish, and just to the right of it at night 
is a beautiful picture at sunset. That's the sun shining off of the beautiful snow on the mountain. That's not lights. That's the sunlight. And I, if I'm not mistaken, I would think the moon would probably do the same thing. And it would be just as beautiful. So moving from there. With all the energy on this earth and all of our tools that we have as mere human beings, working with Mother Earth is actually a gift to us. She's allowing us wonderful stones and crystals, which are imbued with wonderful energies of different kinds, just like the chakra stones in a couple of the pictures, or the white or the beautiful blue crystals. Some people can actually harness this wonderful energy in their body. They can attune to it and do Reiki healing or even therapeutic massage. And I know of people that actually practice kitchen witchery that chant or just even think about a nice meal that they're making and put a nice bit of loving energy and focus on nourishing who's going to eat that meal. And I think it's actually true when you bake bread also because you need the dough, not just cooking or, or, or baking. I think it can be anything creative that you do with your hands. You can imbibe the energy into that object, whether it's woodwork or working with clay, which is part of the earth, of course. And working with other things, arts and crafts, painting, and you can even probably use a lot of this energy in crystal grids. Like at the beginning, we were looking at the sacred geometry. Getting a crystal grid with one of those patterns on it, the tree of life, or the seed of life, or even the, oh, I just forgot the name of the one I was going to tell you. Yes, one of the, um, the other one I have on there, but it'll probably come to me in a few minutes. I know a lot of people that do crystal gridding, and like I said, this is like a just overview of what I found out. So if anybody is interested in any particular aspect of the subject, we might be able to explore that further in a future lecture. Now, along with the good stuff, there's also naysayers. And I'm not sure who put together this map, but I thought it was interesting that somebody got very dark and was very ambitious to draw lines and plot points across the North American and Central American areas. But I have heard of corpse rose, roads, and that's actually a pretty ancient tradition back in England. And yes, I will answer questions in a few minutes. The corpse roads are actually places, and I wrote this down so I can tell you, I found it in one of the books and also online. It's a road to transport corpses to cemeteries that had burial rites, such as parishes, churches, and chapels. So it was pretty much a Christian thing. They were also called beer roads, burial roads, coffin lines, coffin road, corpse way, funeral road, a leash way, procession way, or a church way. So I can kind of see how race or spirits or ghosts might kind of stick to those areas, roaming up and down with the energy. We've all heard of haunted roads, right? <laughs> I'm not sure how the disasters coordinate with this, unless you think about the energies coming together with multiple ley lines that cross. I can see how that potential would be problematic because of the large amount of power that this can actually release. 
As far as ghosts, we've all heard about ghosts in specific places that are tied to specific places. And this could be actually on corpse roads too. A lot of people are afraid to go on those roads other than taking their dead to a place of permanent rest. But along with that, couldn't there possibly be fairy paths such as in the woods? We do have fairy circles with like mushrooms and things that pop up in our yards. Most of them are toadstools, don't eat them please. And I think there would also be dimensional gateways. Who's to say there's not one? Energy centers, transports from one place to another. I mean, possible alien visitations, star seeds even. There could be a lot of different ideas that we could explore, or you could even read about. The internet's huge, you could look it up. If you're interested in a particular area of ley lines or energy centers, look up at least three to five resources. Don't just take one resource as canon. So you'll get more input from multiple authors writing blogs or even talking through videos or podcasts or something but it is a possibility i'm not going to rule out anything at this point something else that i was thinking about was time warps you know how you get into a good book and you're reading and all of a sudden either several hours pass or no time passes and you think Oh, I've read this much. This amount of time should have passed. Or maybe if you're traveling, and this has happened to me many times, you get into the zone and watch the traffic and really focus on your destination. You're not speeding. You're behaving. Everybody's being nice around you in their cars. You're sending gratitude out for courteous driving around you. You're being courteous yourself. And all of a sudden, when it's supposed to take a certain amount of time to get into one place, it maybe takes part of that time. Who's to say that wasn't along one of these energy paths? And it just kind of helped you along. Time actually is just a measurement. It's not a thing. But like dimensional gateways or fairy paths or ghost roads, um, it can be a possibility. So I see a couple of things in the comment. I'm going to pull the chat down. And Moana, the Disney movie is interesting. Yes, how it actually relates. It would be nice if they re-released that. I like that movie. Yeah, I have gotten lost in cyberspace a lot way down that rabbit hole and also there have been times where i look up and it's like okay i've been reading a lot i have not skipped anything i'm not a speed reader i'm actually a bit dyslexic so it takes me a couple of times sometimes to read a sentence and move on but occasionally it's like in the zone and in the zone can refer to anything you're really really focused on and a lot of times they find that when people are in the zone then your heart rate balances your breathing calms you relax a lot more because you're interested in what you're reading and you're Mental synapses just go really crazy because of all this wonderful information that's coming in. So that's basically what I have. Wanted to thank you all very much for listening. And if anybody has questions, I am going to stop the sharing and we will Put you all back on screen. Let's see what I can do here.